It's December of 2009. I'm 16 years old, and I'm at our town's public library with some of my classmates. And as the Saturday afternoon sun filters through the frosted glass windows of the library's reading room, I'm realizing that the most unusual thing about the situation isn't the fact that I'm spending a beautiful day at the library. It's that I'm spending it with other people. There are six of us gathered around a heavy wooden table and stapled yellow packets of case files and witness affidavits are spread out in front of us. In less than three months, we would all be in Boston, competing at this year's Harvard Model Congress Conference, arguing these cases in front of a mock judge and jury as one of our school's two district court teams. Now, the conference is still months away, but the unfamiliar discomfort of hanging out with people outside of school hours is already starting to make me nervous. As I spin a highlighter around with my finger, I see a book sitting on a shelf above where my teammate Kia is sitting. On its spine, in big red block letters, it says, conservative comebacks to liberal lies. As my teammates continue to flip through their case files, I walk over to where Kia is sitting, and taking the book off the shelf, I say to the team, this is genius. I am taking this home, and I am reading the entire thing. Now, they know I'm 100% serious. Standing at barely five foot three in my black Converse, few people would have guessed that I am, in fact, our school's local militant far-right conservative. You could call it my version of putting on heavy eyeliner and listening to punk rock. In the coastal New England town where I live, where everyone votes down to get Democrat and not a lot of people go to church, where people love recycling almost as much as they love telling other people to recycle, being openly Republican is a dead giveaway to everyone else that you are different. Now, I've always known that I was different, but it doesn't start with me being a Republican. It starts in the first grade, where a blonde boy with bangs cut straight across pulls his eyes back at me and makes kung fu sounds in my direction. He seems to think this is funny, and so does everyone else on the playground, and so I copy him and try to get in on the joke, because at least that way I'd be fitting in. It continues into seventh grade choir rehearsal, where I see a group of girls sitting in the back of the room, picking at their fingernails, patently disinterested in whatever our poor choir director is trying to teach us that day. And I remember a guidance counselor telling us that kids who act out are probably feeling left out. So in a gesture of goodwill, I pull up a chair next to them and join them in the back. But as it turns out, I'm the one who's unwelcome. The entire rehearsal, they make comments about my glasses, my dorky Walmart sneakers, my off-brand backpack filled to the brim with books and papers. They keep calling me little Asian girl. And all I want to do is scream at them, I have a name, you know? Ninth grade. A teacher tells me that I have great leadership potential and that I should run for class president. And at this point, I'd believe a teacher's word over literally anyone else's, so I do it. I run. And for a while, it seems to be going pretty OK. And it seems like I have a good chance at winning. But one day, I log into Facebook, and I see the names and profile pictures of people I know making fun of me. Because for whatever reason, it seems that there's something inherently hilarious about someone like me thinking that they can become class president. They talk about voting me in as a joke. I win the election, but it feels like a devastating loss. Church is the one place where I don't feel like an outsider. At church, I'm taught that it's OK to be rejected by your peers, even something to be expected. I'm told that the world hates Christians. And I shouldn't be so surprised when I find out that the world hates me, too. I start to put two and two together. In our coastal New England town that loves recycling, racism is a relic of the past solved by marches on Washington and our first black president. So my only logical conclusion is that the only reason why I can't fit in has to be because of my faith and my conservative values that I had inherited from my church because that's the only place I knew I could trust people. With this newfound confidence and conviction, I walk into the halls of my school every day to ready to be on the offensive, determined to trigger and offend every snowflake liberal I run into, if just to say, I'm not here to fit in. I'm not here to be one of you, because I know you don't want me either. But Kia's never been one to turn on an opportunity for an intellectual debate. And after all, the six of us joined Model Congress because we liked politics, even if we didn't like each other's politics. 
So as I'm flipping through the pages of the book I'd just taken off the shelf, I see Kia raise an eyebrow at me as she asks a question. Okay, I'll bite. Name me one conservative comeback to a liberal lie. The group laughs and so do I, but mostly out of panic because I have no idea how to respond. And my usual overblown confidence is failing me. And I'm realizing that I'm not used to being confronted. I'm not used to having to answer for my beliefs beyond my usual take it or leave it. I'm not used to someone being genuinely interested in hearing what I have to say. I'm not used to telling them. As the five faces look back at me from that table, I'm overcome with a sense of fear and trepidation. If this is what being on a team's all about, I'm in for the ride of my life. Fast forward three months. The six of us are laughing and lounging in our connected hotel room at the Boston Sheridan, complaining about how exhausted we are from a full weekend of trying cases and how much homework we have to catch up on. The weekend's just been too hectic for us, sussing out our latest competitor and re-strategizing for us to think about what this experience has meant to the six of us and how it's somehow brought us together. It's 11.30 p.m. and there's a knock at the door. It's conference staff and they're here with a surprise. They hand us a thick stack of papers and tell us that we have less than nine hours to prepare a brand new case for an emergency hearing the next morning. Our team would be arguing for the defense. We ask who would be on the prosecution. The conference staffer smiles. We would be going up against the other district court team from our school. We pile into one room and shove the members of our now rival team into the other, slamming and deadbolting the door between us before we begin to collectively panic. But the panic doesn't stay around for long. Not only do we think of the past weekend we'd spent together at the conference, but of the last three months of tireless preparation. Countless hours spent grilling each other on cross and direct examination questions, building case theory, doing research, arguing with each other on how best to set up a line of questioning or how to frame the story of a witness. Learning to trust each other. Walking around the halls of our school with our case files sandwiched between our books, the bright yellow paper, a not so subtle indication to everyone around us that we were part of a team, this team. As we stared at the stack of papers in front of us and we looked at each other, we realized that we trusted each other with everything that we had. It's February of 2010. I'm 16 years old and I'm crouched on the floor of the Boston Sheridan Hotel with five other people trying to cram my entire witness statement into my head in just one night. And I'm realizing for the first time in my life that this must be what it feels like to not be alone. And as the midnight oil burns, and the cold of the Boston winter seeps through the, halls of, seeps through the walls of our hotel room, a warm but unfamiliar thought washes over me. These are my friends, and I would do anything for them. The words are like sea waves, breaking upon the shore in a steady rhythm as we continue our work into the night. The next morning, after a long night of writing opening statements and memorizing witness accounts, the six of us march into that courtroom, lock eyes with our friends from the other team, and argue the case of our lives. And 90 minutes later, as we hear the head jury begin to read out his verdict with the words, not guilty, we knew that our teamwork had paid off. We'd won. When I became a teacher, I started a model Congress chapter at Christian Heritage School because I wanted my students to experience the same kind of true transformative community that I had experienced when I was 16. The creation of Model Congress came almost exactly one year after probably what will probably go down in history as one of the most pivotal and contentious presidential elections of my students' lifetimes. Political noise in the form of internet hot takes, 15 second video clips, tweets and retweets in their crudeness and oversimplicity seemed to blaspheme the delicate, complex, precious things that quite literally govern the humanity and dignity of so many people. And as many of us saw the ugliness of that noise, we might have thought to ourselves, if this is how politics is gonna be discussed, we want no part in it. But as we chose to tune out each other's politics, we also chose to tune out each other. Politics is the science of living in community. Through systems of governance and effective policy that serves to benefit not just some, but all, politics is the mechanism through which an impossibly diverse body of people with differing, even conflicting values can somehow share the same space together and help each other thrive. 
Put this way, politics holds within itself the key to perhaps the most important and sacred thing about being human, the ability to peacefully coexist with each other. But as it turns out, different people have different ideas on how that should happen. And that creates conflict. And conflict in its diametrical opposition with our fundamental desire for peaceful coexistence is what keeps us from talking about politics with each other. In a grand twist of irony, our fear that talking about politics will cause further division is exactly what's driving us apart. The fact that we are afraid to talk about the very thing that has the unique power to bring us into closer community with each other. We fear talking about politics because at its core, the political is profoundly personal. We cut conversations short by saying, we'll agree to disagree, if only to preserve this veneer of civility between us. But as black American novelist James Baldwin once said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and a denial of my humanity and right to exist. Political discourse is not an open forum where people just shout their values and beliefs out loud only to walk back into their own corner, drop the mic and high five their politically like-minded friends. It's not even trying to find middle ground, which is a convenient phrase that we often use to avoid thinking about and talking with each other about the oppression and denial of dignity and humanity that James Baldwin talks about. It's hearing the sound of your own voice as you speak those values and beliefs out loud and realizing that having a belief means taking responsibility for it. And as you feel the weight of that responsibility hang in the air, as you look at the five faces sharing the same table as you, you might begin to realize, like I did, that you cannot have a political opinion that attempts to govern the lives and the rights of other people unless you have tried to empathize with and listen to those people first. And you might begin to realize, like I did, that there could be room for your beliefs to grow and change as well. I want to bring us back to the Boston Sheridan Hotel. This time, it's February of 2020. I'm 26 years old, and I'm back in the exact same room that I was in 10 years ago on that cold Sunday morning where, after a long night of lots of caffeine and not a lot of sleep, my friends and I argued the case of our lives. This time, it's not me up there on the witness stand, but one of my students who, with five of her now closest friends, are now arguing the case of their lives at this year's Harvard Model Congress. I look at the team, and I realize that the six of them are such odd company. There's the student chaplain who is rising from the plaintiff's table to raise an objection, but behind him is a student who's made it clear that she doesn't believe in God, and she's whispering words of advice to him to help him strategize on the fly. Next to her is a student who's brand new to the school this year, and she's giving a nod of encouragement to the girl sitting on the witness stand who has attended the school her whole life. I think about what it must have taken for this team to get the, to where they are today, for them to have this kind of trust in each other, despite the conspicuous differences in their beliefs, values, backgrounds, experiences. What kind of clashes and confrontations did they have to have for them to realize that there was so much for them to learn from each other? What was their moment in the library reading room like? A couple months later, I catch wind that two of the students in that group are in a heated debate over the pro-life lobby's role in creating single-issue voters amongst evangelical Christians. It's a debate that few Christians on either side of the issue are willing to get into because the potential for division and conflict is just so high. But at Model Congress, it's not uncommon to see good friends take opposite sides on a contentious issue and emerge from the debate with their friendship not just intact, but strengthened. Programs like Model Congress help students dive deep into the most complex, pressing issues concerning our society today, which then gives them the confidence to, to talk about politics openly, candidly, and intelligently. But more importantly is this. At Model Congress, the politics isn't the point. The community is. Every day, I see kids work through difficult conversations and polarizing politics, all the while somehow knitting their community more closely together rather than tearing it apart. They're able to do this because they know that refusing to understand each other's politics is the same as refusing to understand each other. They've normalized 
having hard conversations about political issues because they know that their community is only as strong as the extent to which they're challenging each other to empathize with each other. And they know that the end game of joining a political debate club like Model Congress is not the empty hubris of winning an argument, but of the lifelong friendships that result from it. Just like the lifelong friendship that I have with Gio Esposito, who's here tonight, and who 10 years ago was there with me on the floor of the Boston Hotel, trying to memorize and prepare for an emergency case at three in the morning. Right now, on November 2nd, 2020, as we are gathered together on the eve of what will yet be another history-defining presidential election in the lives of young people. Those same young people are looking for safe, brave spaces where they can talk about politics openly and candidly while also knowing that no matter what, they are loved, valued, accepted, and respected for who they are and where they're at right now that their humanity and the stories that have brought them to why they believe what they believe in this moment inherently are valid and have value, even if they're as broken and misguided as mine once was. We are all still works in progress, after all, and it is love that redeems those stories. If you're a parent or a teacher to a young person, you already have created one of the two requirements needed to create the kind of spaces that these young people are searching for tonight, through the love and the warmth and compassion you bring to your classrooms and homes every single day. Can I challenge you to take that one step further tomorrow on election day by opening up a space for the young people in your life where they can talk bravely and openly about what will be a history-defining moment in their young lives? Can you, after we listen to the rest of tonight's amazing speakers and you turn off this live stream, can I challenge you to call your kids down to join you at the living room couch or put up a post on your Google Classroom page inviting the people around you to engage in an open and brave discussion about this history-defining moment? Even if you're looking at this task in front of you and you're like, I'm not sure, I don't want to say the wrong thing, I don't know what the right way is, don't worry, you are not alone, we are right there with you. But the great thing is that there are other teachers and parents just like you who have been preparing and sharing resources for this very moment. You're not alone. We're going to do this together. My hope is that we will be able to teach an entire generation of young people that it is possible to engage in politics in a way that doesn't destroy community, but somehow creates it. I hope you'll join me in pursuing this dream. Thank you.